Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this exciting new series of webinars. My name is Dr. Shiv Sivapalan, and I'm a family physician and also the Director of Clinical Operations at SAC Autism Center. Joining me today is Kira Vimalakandan. Kira, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Hi there, my name is Kira Vimalakandan, and I'm a therapist and the CARES Program Co-Lead at the SAC Autism Center. So Kira and I are really excited that over the next few days, we're able to bring to you these four webinars that are focused on caregivers. It's a topic that we're both so passionate about. We really hope that by the end of these webinars, you'll learn some skills and strategies that you can use in your day-to-day -day lives. Being a father myself, I know that caregiving can be a uniquely rewarding experience, but at the same time, it can be mentally and physically demanding job. And without proper support, it can take a toll on your health and your psyche, eventually depleting your reserves. I think this is especially relevant Shiv, during the pandemic and how caregivers have asked to do so much more with much less than they usually have access to. And then add to that social distancing and the limited contact that we've all had with our families the lack of uh, opportunities for the normal recreation and respite activities that we might otherwise have access to. This has led to so many additional stressors. And with time, your battery can gradually get depleted, leading to what we call caregiver burnout. And Kara, you really highlighted, again, how the pandemic has had such a significant impact on caregivers and their mental health. A lot of them are suffering from burnout and some, which is sad, may not even be aware that some of these symptoms that they're experiencing are, are those of burnout. So I think it's good to start by defining what burnout actually is. So burnout is defined as a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. It can also be associated with a change in attitude to one that is typically more negative and unconcerned not because you actually don't care, but it's because you're just so drained. And there are a number of things that can drain every caregiver's battery. I'll touch on a few of them here. So first, unrealistic expectations. I think a lot of caregivers place unreasonable de demands upon themselves in part because they see providing care as almost as if it's like their exclusive responsibility. In reality, you have to be able to look after yourself as well in order to look after your loved one. And another part of the unrealistic expectations piece is that many caregivers expect their involvement to have almost a uniformly positive effect on the health and happiness of their loved ones. And this might not reflect the daily ups and downs of caregiving, which can lead to disappointment and sometimes even guilt about how effective you are as a caregiver. Another big one when it comes to draining your battery is lack of control. Many caregivers become frustrated by a lack of money, other resources and skills that are needed to effectively plan, manage and organize their loved one's care. It's, it's a big job and sometimes we just don't have the amount of control that we wish we would have over it. Family stress or social pressures can also play a role. That is how the broader social network or community perceives the caregiver and communicates their expectations. That can also be incredibly stressful. And we know how hard it can be to add the weight of this to one's own expectations for caregiving. Financial stressors, stressors that one is pretty self-explanatory. We've already talked a little bit about limited finances playing a role. And cultural perceptions. So the role of a caregiver can differ between cultural contexts, and this can deeply affect what it means to be a caregiver, as well as the level of support that caregivers are willing to seek. And I also want to highlight role confusion. For family members or close others for whom caregiving may be a new role, taking this on can be a difficult shift. For example, we know that siblings often step into the role of caring and advocating, and it can be hard to separate the role of caregiver from the natural relationship that you may have with the loved one that you're caring for. And Kira, you really highlighted a great point around culture and how the role of a caregiver can really differ from culture to culture. We know that in certain cultures, it may actually be discouraged to seek support outside the family, or in some cultures may believe that caregiving is just a duty 
or that respite care is breaking away from caregiving responsibilities. And in some cultures, there may be a belief that caregiving responsibilities should not be done by institutions. So by taking cultural context into consideration, it may explain the degree to which caregiving is culturally embedded and how it may preclude some caregivers from questioning the caregiving role and or seeking support. Therefore, cultural context may explain why the degree of isolation felt by caregivers of certain backgrounds may be even more profound. With all of these factors draining your battery, this can lead to a variety of symptoms. And as a physician, I commonly come across caregivers with symptoms of persistent fatigue, trouble sleeping, or increased irritability. Some may even complain of like body aches or changes in their appetite or getting sick more often. However, the interesting part is most of them will initially believe that their symptoms are due to a possible undiagnosed thyroid issue or low iron or low vitamin B12. But when their blood work comes back normal, most of them feel confused as to why they're suffering from these symptoms. And this is normally when I start to approach the topic of burnout with them, because the reality is in the majority of these cases, these symptoms are actually a sign of burnout. And what I normally try to highlight to my patients is that these symptoms can not only lead to mental and physical exhaustion for themselves, but can also impact the ones they love and that they care for. This is why self-care is so important. But you may be asking yourself, what is self-care? Put simply, these are the things that you do on a daily basis to take care of yourself. However, it's easier said than done and is an undervalued skill, which is crucial for your own physical and mental health, as well as your ability to care for others. I think it helps change your perspective. Um, it puts your needs first. It builds resilience, strength, and a sense of empowerment. I think there are a lot of myths that people sort of carry about self-care, such as it's selfish or it takes away from more important things in their lives. But the reality is that in being able to take care of yourself, you actually make yourself a more effective caregiver. How can you really sort of support someone else when your own battery is drained, right? And another one is that people think that the impact of self-care is temporary, when in reality, those little things that we're able to do over the day actually allows us to stretch, you know, our tolerance and our resilience for weeks or for months at a time. It's not something that we can really put off and put off because as we do, our batteries, as we've kind of talked about, are losing their charge. Self-care is also not the same for everyone. It's not a one size fits all approach. It's actually quite unique for people depending on what they like, what really gets them sort of back to that full battery. And some of those things can be really foundational, but other things might be hobbies or interests that you have that are unique to you. So how do we recharge our batteries? Um, I think first, it's crucial to try and set realistic goals for self-care, the ones that, you know, Kira kind of highlighted, but also accepting that you may need to turn to others to help with caregiving in order to meet those self-care goals. And next, which is something as a physician, we really try to emphasize with our patients is really focusing on the foundation of what is needed for a healthy body and mind. This means eating right, and getting plenty of exercise and sleep. Other ways may be as simple as ensuring that you're taking lunch breaks or going for walks during lunch rather than just working through them. Other activities that can help recharge your battery are writing in a journal, spending time in nature, or practicing spiritual self-care. It may be even worthwhile to try and experiment with different self-care strategies to figure out which one helps you the most. Maybe there's a hobby or a sport that you've always wanted to pick up, or maybe you can practice new ways to relax, such as yoga or mindfulness. Mindfulness is actually great for self-care and something we'll be covering in our next session. It's also really helpful to find someone you trust to talk about your feelings and frustrations. That can be a great way to practice self-care. 
Research has shown that this can be healing by reducing stress and physical and emotional distress. This can be a friend, a colleague, or even a professional. Or even better, join a caregiver support group. Sharing your feelings and experiences with others in the same situation can help you manage stress, locate helpful resources, and reduce feelings of frustration and isolation. And actually, if you're looking for a support group, we'd love for you to join CARES. This is an eight-week caregiver skills and support group that is available for free through Autism Ontario. And actually, one of our main topics is stress management and self-care. In CARES, you'll learn quick activities that you can do on a regular basis to help recharge during the day, some of which may only take a minute of your time. One of our main goals is to help you try new things with self-care and make it part of your daily routine, ultimately to build emotional resilience and provide effective care to your loved ones. One way, and I think this is gonna be a great activity, but one way in which we can add simple but effective self-care in our day is by generating and practicing affirmations. So what are affirmations? These are positive statements to rely on that can boost your confidence or make you feel better when you're having a hard day. Self-affirmation has been demonstrated to lower stress and rumination. There's also MRI evidence suggesting that certain neural pathways are increased when people practice self-affirmation activities. And these might feel inauthentic at first, but by choosing a statement or two each day and really focusing on the intention behind it, you might be able to believe and, and draw some strength from this kind of practice. I quite frequently rely on a few affirmations uh, on those busy and stressful clinic days. Uh, one that I really love, especially on those days where I may have like a hundred things on the run, is this one. I can, I will, end of story. It really gives me the motivation to keep going and pushing forward. And another one that really kind of stands out to me is uh, one from Ram Das, an American psychologist who wrote, you're loved just for being who you are, just for existing. In those stressful moments, when we sometimes can be really hypercritical of ourselves, it reminds us that you don't have to do anything for this love. It will always be there and no one can take that from you. And I think these, along with videos of my kids, have really worked well in the past when I'm trying to reframe a stressful day. Ooh, that last one gave me chills. I really liked that one. Personally, I really like borrowing the affirmations I've heard from Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, I think it helps me when I'm nervous about something, such as preparing for this webinar. So I say to myself, I need to take up space. I'm here. I'm experienced enough to do this. I'm knowledgeable and prepared. I'm mature enough to do this. I can do this. And we'd love to hear from both of you, uh, from all of you in the audience, uh, about affirmations that you might say to yourselves, the ones that get you through the day or, or make you really feel good about yourself when, when you're having a bad time. And Today, Kira and I really highlighted a few strategies to help with preventing burnout and ways to help recharge your battery. If you'd love to learn more about some of these strategies, feel free to join our CARES program offered in partnership with Autism Ontario. The good news is that it's completely free, can be done in the comfort of your own home, and really prioritizes you, the caregiver. So feel free to join us and not only learn to recharge your battery, but also on how to keep it charged. Thank you all for listening to us today. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that webinar and we are now inviting everyone in the audience to, you know, feel free to ask any questions that you might have about caregiver burnout. All right. So Shiv, why don't we take a look at some of the questions that we've gotten so far. And so one that we've gotten here is, when your battery is being drained, is it in all areas at the same time or only within certain areas? 
I think like that that one's a very it's actually very interesting. That's a good question to ask because it doesn't necessarily start off all in one. It doesn't necessarily start with physical symptoms as well as symptoms of exhaustion. It may just start with one and gradually build up. So you may initially start with maybe a bit of neck stiffness, maybe some headaches, and then it gets into feeling exhausted or having trouble sleeping. And each one of these symptoms can kind of build off each other um, and kind of add to other symptoms. Kira, do you, do you feel that's the same with, uh, you know, the patients that you've kind of dealt with? Absolutely. It's a tough balance. But at the end of the day, I think we have to take some time to, to attend to all those different domains uh, that are important to building a balanced lifestyle. All right. So we've got another question here. Um, would you have any tips on building motivation? I often feel that I'm that I want to make changes, but I feel stuck and unable to get motivated. I think one of the uh, misconceptions that people have about motivation, and Shiv, you've probably seen this all the time as well, is that we have to feel sort of completely motivated to do whatever it is that we want to be doing. But some things are really difficult. I don't know about you, Shiv, but exercise, for example, can, can be really tough um, for me to work up the energy to or motivation to actually want to do. But what I've found and what I've suggested to my clients is that actually being able to get out the door and start something can often make motivation follow. And that's actually like really interesting as well, right? It's it's this aspect, sometimes we, we get stuck in, uh, in, in, like you mentioned, Kara, like a rut, right? And we just can't kind of get out of it. And we really want to engage. We want to start to push forward. And sometimes when we think of doing that, we we almost want to jump too far ahead. We, we want to make big changes versus just maybe trying to do something very small and, and aiming low initially um, so you can start to build up those uh, that that um, motivation to kind of keep going forward. So just doing small activities, maybe it's just taking some time to have a cup of coffee um, or just waking up a bit earlier so you can just maybe do a mindfulness activity for like five minutes, just little things like that that you can build off of. Um, and now Kara, there's a great question at the, uh, that just came in right now. Um, I've got sick more and more. Um, I'm, being, I'm being a circle of stress and feeling stuck, is there any support for parents or kids with ASD about therapy? So that sounds a lot like CARES, our caregiver support group. Exactly. Like, I think that's exactly what we, uh, you know, did CARES for. And the benefit is with CARES, it's completely free. So it kind of addresses that. It's primarily for um, caregivers, and it's focused on that with the aspect of really teaching uh, caregiver skills and helping them connect with each other so that they can better help manage some of those stressful situations and some of those challenges that you may encounter in life. Kira, do you want to kind of add on to what CARES is about? Well, CARES is an eight-week skills-based support group for parents, uh, such as many of you watching today, um, and caregivers of, you know, children with autism. And we are able to draw on that shared experience that everyone has, that wisdom that you all have as caregivers, um, you know, just experiencing those day to day challenges, especially throughout um, these most recent times with low resources and uh, not as many supports as we're all used to. And what CARES does is bring together a community of people to, to support each other. Um, and along the way, not only do we draw on sort of that wisdom of the crowd, but we also teach some really great skills, some of which we covered today around caregiver burnout, um, but also skills that we'll be covering in upcoming webinars around mindfulness, self-compassion, problem solving, assertive communication. Now, I see that Edie in the chat um, has asked, how do we join CARES? Um, and if you take a look at the handouts attached to this webinar, uh, you'll see a registration link to the next offering of CARES. Um, so we're really excited for all of you to, to come and see what CARES is all about. And another uh, 
a great question um, that we just got asked was, while many of the suggestions that have been made are useful, they aren't always practical or accessible. Often the reality of being a caregiver is that we're isolated because we lack the time and energy to build and keep a network of support. How do we take time out when there's no one to lean on? Kira, do you want to take this first and then I'll add on to it? Sounds good. I'm, I'm so sorry, Jody. I, I, I think I hear that from a lot of the caregivers that I work with, just those feelings of isolation, um, certainly not having the, the time and the energy and having that sort of drained battery, right? And networks of support are, are hard to come by. It takes time to build those relationships. I think one of the great things about this pro program that we offer CARES is that it is entirely virtual. And so you can join from the comfort of your home. Um, it's an hour a week and it's a period of time that we think is really important for caregivers to be able to, to support themselves. So um, really prioritizing their needs um, and teaching lots of sort of practical skills that we hope that you can kind of use throughout the week. So even with things like mindfulness, uh, we talk about strategies to uh, to build into your day that only take a few minutes of your time and even can be incorporated into activities that you're already doing. So for example, and again, this is something we'll talk about in, in our next webinar, but um, trying to be mindful while you're having a cup of coffee or in the shower. So really building in practical stress management and uh, strategies and skills that you can build into your day that don't require a whole lot of time and energy. And, and Jody, just to add on to what Kira said, is we really try to cater our the, the different activities and um, you know skills uh, that we talk about in the CARES program to what families have really asked us for. And, and this, what you just mentioned, is a very common question we got asked. So we really wanted to make sure the activities could be fit into your day to day routine, really not taking too much time, and also something that you can do. Um, in the comfort of even like your car, like say you're just dropping off uh, your child for therapy um, and you have like a few minutes or um, the comfort of like, you know, your desk at work. Like there's so many different um, environments that we hope that some of these activities can be used in. Um, so we really try to cater to that. And CARES also takes the sort of energy out of having to build and keep a network of support because it's sort of an instant group uh, that you can sort of lean on. Um, and again, we talked about this idea of drawing from shared experiences and all these caregivers have the benefit of having been through very similar experiences. And we think that that can be really, really reinforcing um, when you feel so isolated otherwise. Okay, and there's another question. I'm a single parent of a seven-year-old who um, would talk to me all day if they could. And I feel bad when I can't always engage with him, either because I'm busy or tired. Any suggestions? Kara, do you wanna take this? Sure, that's that's a really tricky one. And I think with, you know, especially being a single parent, it feels like you, you just have to be constantly on and constantly responding to the needs of your child. And it's so lovely. It sounds like you have a great relationship with your child. You've developed this culture of openness and it sounds like they can talk to you about anything. Um, I think being able to engage in different sorts of activities, maybe soothing activities um, that might not involve a whole lot of talking that might actually be stress relieving uh, for both of you. So you know, often with my clients, uh, my young clients, I, I color and we don't do a whole lot of talking during that time. Certain things might come up, but it's it's a really nice sensory activity um, that engages, you know, both adults and children. And, and I think that's also great about the CARES program because some of those activities um, can really be done like as a family um, or with your, um, you know, your child. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be done alone. Um, it's just with the CARES program, we risk try to prioritize that, you know, ideally you just having some time for yourself just to focus on those aspects. Those activities. Um, with Um, that talks about that's kind of also related to this um, was how long does it take um, or do you recommend 
for self-care. So meaning in general, like how long would it take to do a self-care activity in general? I mean, a self-care activity can be as short as a few seconds. Um, if you take some time to, to do some deep breathing in between whatever else you're doing in that day, that's self-care. Um, and so much of what we already do, the foundational things, you know, sleeping, getting moving, um, eating at the right time, those are all related to self-care, right? So we don't have to reach really far or have these really ambitious self-care goals. Sometimes it's just about getting the basics down. Exactly. I, and I think with self-care, it's really um, trying to kind of um, do it in a sense where you feel one, it's comfortable. It kind of fits in your day. Um, you don't want to have to do something that you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm taking now 20 minutes out of my day and I'm going to be backed up and that's going to add more stress to me, to my day. It, you really want to kind of figure out what works for you, how much time you really can allocate. And I think that's what we go through with care is we kind of really help um, caregivers determine, okay, what's feasible during your day-to-day -day life and what can you incorporate, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you need to incorporate everything. It's just what can you do in those moments. And relatedly, Jean in the chat is asking, are the care sessions during the day or evening? Um, the great thing about that, Jean, is that at Autism Ontario, we have cares groups running at various times in the day. So you can actually pick the one that feels most doable for you and your schedule. Um, and kind of going back related to that self-care aspect, um, another question was asked, uh, Kira, do you have any suggestions on things I can do to help me fall asleep? That's a great one. One of the activities that we often do, I, I would argue many of the activities that we do in CARES, or at least that I've led people through, do put people to sleep, um, which is not great in the middle of the day, but um, things like progressive muscle relaxation, uh, deep breathing, body scans are all fantastic uh, when it comes to helping with sleep. Um, we also talk about sort of other stress management strategies that can decrease you know, your stress, especially towards the end of the day and um, increase those sen those sense, uh, senses of calmness and, you know, soothing that can make it an easier transition as you head to bed. Exactly. Right. Really with strategies to help with sleep or what we call sleep hygiene is just really minimizing um, activities that may stimulate or promote more energy near the end of the day or certain things like caffeine or caffeinated products near the end of the day and doing activities that are typically more calming and allowing you to just focus on that moment. And mindfulness activities are really great in doing that. And and like Karen, I have really mentioned, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time to do that. And it can actually be done even in bed just before you go to sleep. And you'll you'll typically notice that after doing it a few times, that one, you'll be able to get to sleep sooner. And two, you'll probably be able to sleep throughout the night without waking up. Um, because a lot of times when we're stressed and anxious, we'll wake up multiple times during the night thinking about things that may have happened during the day. Absolutely. There's one last question here that I just want to ask before we kind of wrap up is a parent mentions, I feel guilty asking for help. How do I overcome this? That's a great question. I, I've seen another one in the chat like it, which is just, you know, what if you have a really hard time opening up about your issues or how you feel? Everything is bottled up and there's no one you feel comfortable opening up to. That guilt around disclosure and, and being able to, to share how you really feel, um, often because, you know, there's a really sort of positive picture painted about caregiving on things like social media, it feels like everyone else is just doing better, right? Exactly, right? So as we're starting to wrap up, we just want to let everyone know that, um, you know, this presentation or so this webinar, well, it's actually going to be available on demand after, uh, you know, this presentation is done. So please feel free to access that. We've also added the links to um, where you can also register for CARES for the next uh, care session at Autism Ontario, um, where you can also register for our, um, you know, the next few web webinars. Uh, so Kara and I will be doing another three webinars that kind of cover some of the topics that we also cover in our CARES program around self-care and mindfulness. So you can also register for that over there, as well as we've also attached the slides in both English and French 
uh, from today's presentation. So feel free to have a look. Um, and, you know, for all those caregivers out there, we'd love to see you in our CARES program, um, you know, going forward. And like we said, Oxfam Ontario has been great at carrying this program and be making it different times during the day, um, at different times during the year, so that um, we can, you know, give families um, the best support available. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.